The city of Murfreesboro today is a growing southern town half an hour from Nashville, Tennessee. In the past, however, before the Civil War, Murfreesboro consisted almost entirely of sprawling plantations, a few businesses, and pockets of residential neighborhoods surrounding the courthouse. The history of Murfreesboro is inextricably tied to the history of the United States, and especially the South, and its role in the Civil War remains a key feature of local history. The Stones River Battle takes place on December 31st, 1862 through the new year, January 2nd, 1863. So <clears throat> once the Union Army, they're here before that, once the battle ends, they stay here for the rest of the war. It was this small town that Mary Murphy, Kate Carney, and Anna Butler called home in the latter half of the 19th century. And it is the stories of these three women that tell a larger narrative. Their actions reveal the deeper, fuller history of women, the South, and the transition that took place in the time after the Civil War, when Southern upheaval was the greatest and when opportunities for women shifted. The life of Mary Murphy follows closely with the history of Murfreesboro. Mary became the famous novelist and short story writer under the nom de plume Charles Egbert Craddock, whose tales of frontier life in Tennessee met a new desire among 19th century readers for realistic tales with moral themes. And she spent much of her life near no, Murfreesboro. Uh, she was very influential in Rutherford County and Murfreesboro's history. Her father was, this will answer some other questions too, her father was William Law Murphy, and her grandfather was Colonel Hardy Murphy. So Colonel Hardy Murphy, being a Revolutionary War soldier out of uh, North Carolina, receives a land grant for basically what becomes Murfreesboro. I mean, all the lands in the future city of Murfreesboro and a little beyond the original Murfreesboro, as well as Williamson County, Franklin area, as well as some land in Davidson County. Um, at his death in the early 1800s, Colonel Hardy Murphy owned like 22,000 acres. So huge land holdings in Middle Tennessee. Her parents were heirs to the plantation Grantlands, where Mary spent much of her childhood. Mary was tutored by a governess, and her parents took a fairly active role in her education, her father working to ensure she learned Latin and had a foundation in literature. It was in her father's library that she became acquainted with Cooper, whose tales of Natty Bumpo's frontier adventures perhaps inspired some of her own frontier works, and Scott, whose portrayals of local color would echo in Mary's own characters. Her family's summer retreat in Bersheba Springs provided the experience with country living and the mountain-dwelling Tennesseans that would later feature prominently in her books. Mary was a sickly child, suffering from the effects of an illness at the age of four and she channeled much of her energy into her education, working the way to the top of her classes, even when she moved up into her older sister Fanny's class. The Murphy girls attended a small school for girls until they got older, when they went to Nashville and later to Philadelphia to continue their education. For all intents and purposes, the Murphys lived an idyllic Southern life with all the luxuries and privileges afforded a white slave-owning family in Antebellum, Tennessee. As with so many plantation families at the time, the Civil War would change the course of Mary's life. During the Civil War, because of its location being very close to what becomes the battlefield of Stones River, um, the house very early in the war, as early as 1862, is ransacked by the Union Army. We know that. Uh, Mary writes about it after the war. Um, and so they dismantled the brick house. Um, they dismantled several brick buildings in town. Many families of Middle Tennessee fled to Nashville after the Civil War started, finding their homes in the midst of battlefields and encampments. The Murphys followed this pattern, as did the Carney family. Kate Carney, whose diary records her life surrounding the Civil War, was from a plantation-owning family as well. Her father was a wealthy merchant, and while their home was in Murfreesboro, they spent little time there until after the war. In 1861, Kate left her uncle's plantation in Mississippi to reunite with her parents in Nashville. It was there that Kate truly grew into a Confederate sympathizer, and despite the city's Union occupation, she and her friends, mostly from Murfreesboro families as well, defied their perceived oppressors in small ways, crossing blockades without proper paperwork 
staying out past curfew, refusing to behave civilly around Union soldiers. These small actions of defiance were all recorded in Kate's diary, full of wartime news written alongside her daily choice of reading and the purchase or repair of dresses and bonnets. Mostly written when she was 18, Kate's diary provides insight into an elite young woman's life in Civil War Nashville. It shows her active and passionate interest in politics and news, recording the arrival of newspapers and guests who carried information about the war. It reveals a young woman caring deeply about the world around her and desiring to take an active role in it. It is a pity, therefore, that Kate burned the other volumes of her own diaries upon her marriage to Thomas Carney, a cousin mentioned occasionally during her time in Nashville. After 1862, there are no further entries until she made one last note in 1876. Her last entry reads, Have burnt the rest of my journal up, and expect some day to get courage to destroy this. I'm married now, foolishness must be laid aside. A period has been placed at the end of my old life, and a new era has begun since February 3rd, 1875. Kate's desire to separate from her diaries and her Confederate sympathies was understandable. Women were often just as shocked, if not more so, by the outcome of the war, and the effects of war echoed for decades. Marriage did not mean the end of interest in national affairs or education, however. Some have argued that white Southern women now expected to have a greater amount of authority in the home. Uh, others have said no, that it changed. Um, and that actually what they wanted was for Southern white men to reassert their uh, patriarchal roles and to make it possible for them to do so. But all of those debates aside, um, it, it is quite clear that still the overwhelming expectation is that all women will marry, will become wives, will become mothers. And that is a fundamental expectation that really does not change. That is still uh, very much identified with what it means to be a woman. Uh, you also might expect though that your spouse would see you more as ha uh, having authority in the home and thus grant you a, a sphere of influence if you will uh, and some authority over children, authority over the management of the household and that your husband might have um, it, a less patriarchal perhaps still paternalistic, but uh, there, there is a movement towards more and more of a companionate marriage ideal. Still, marriage was not an equal partnership by today's standards. Kate Carney and Mary Murphy are linked by their upbringing and status, as well as their writing. But on choosing marriage, the two women took separate paths. Mary never married, and it is interesting to note that despite their very different reasons for writing, it was Miss Murphy who continued to write, long after Mrs. Carney burned most of the evidence that she ever had of doing so. I think that the most common form of women's organized activity was a women's group or a women's circle sometimes they were called mother circles, associated with her church. Another way that women had been involved in organizations and activism was through farm organizations. So the Grange, starting in the 1870s here in Tennessee, for example, then the Agricultural Wheel, the Farmers Alliance, women were members of those organizations. And in the post-Civil War period, of course, the most famous organization is the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And that became the most politically powerful group of women in the United States. Here in Tennessee, the WCTU had a statewide organization by the early 1880s for white women, and then a separate African-American women's uh, statewide union by the later 1880s. So you would have found women whose particular religious beliefs and their social beliefs led them to embrace temperance and prohibition, very active in those two organizations, which could have meant anything, that they just were campaigning on a local level to make sure that their local officials enforced whatever was the law regarding alcohol, 
uh, by the end of the 19th century, it could have meant they were also talking about women's suffrage, what they called the home protection ballot. Uh, they also worked on issues such as raising the age of consent to protect girls from sexual exploitation, all sorts of issues. Many women were involved in social, religious, and political groups before and after marriage. While no record of Kate Carney's membership in such a group has been found at this time, many women like her joined and took active roles in such groups, not only for social interaction, but for political activism. In the North, women took up the cause of suffrage, marching on their state capitals in Washington. For many women of the North, or with Northern education, abolition was their great cause. With the 13th Amendment, politically active white women turned to a cause closer to home, in the South, there was no such united front. Women joined different groups for different reasons. Mary Murphy was no exception. Writing was her profession, but activism was her duty, and a duty that she took seriously. She was an active member in the small Episcopalian Church of Murfreesboro, as well as a founder of the local Daughters of the American Revolution chapter, an inspiration and sponsor of the Craddock Club that was founded at Middle Tennessee State University later in her life. Mary also took up the pen to voice her opinions on religion and salvation, justice, and ideas about civility and morality. While she had been writing since her teens, her first work was published in 1884, at the age of 34. She published under the name Charles Egbert Craddock, to distance a possible failure from her family name and ensure her work was not dismissed by editors. It was a very effective way to get around gender conventions, uh, to have your work reviewed seriously uh, and not with any kind of expectations about it being women's literature or literature by a woman. Of course, men use pen names as well to disguise their identities. But for women like Mary Knowles Murphy, Charles Egbert Craddock was a very effective way of getting uh, uh, an editor in Boston to read her work and to put her in the context of this kind of genre of literature at the time and consider her for publication when perhaps um, he might not have done so otherwise. While she produced 25 novels throughout the course of her life, in addition to articles and short stories, most about Tennessee's unique peoples, dialects, and behaviors, it was her local action that truly made a mark on Murfreesboro. Now she is known more by the fact that she was a writer than for her writing, despite its careful and unique portrayals of East Tennesseans and their lifestyles. Women like Kate Carney and Mary Murphy show two faces of the same coin, Raised in privilege with ready access to education, they made different choices that led to a similar lifestyle, one recorded in history by her unpublished personal works, and the other through her stories and the stories told about her. Other women were not as fortunate. The story of Anna Butler is brief. Only one record of her exists under that name and it merely says that Anna Butler, a ten-year-old colored girl, was given to Mrs. Mary Halliburton as an apprentice in 1872. No other record of Mary Halliburton could be found in Rutherford County. In the estate records of Rutherford County, there are dozens of these transactions, rarely given more than a name, age, and date, almost always with a single descriptive word, colored. For former slaves and their children after the Civil War, freedom was not what they expected. The promises of land and mules proved empty, and rather than sending aid, the federal government enforced regulations that sent many African Americans back to work on the plantations they had fled after the war. Many freed slaves moved to the cities where they hoped to avoid such a life, and many women were left alone to work and care for their children in the cities and towns while their husbands worked the fields. So all of a sudden you have the minority becoming the majority in town. Uh, statistically, you go from a time before the war that you know, one in four people in town are enslaved African Americans. You would have had slaves in town just like on the plantations out in the countryside. They would have been you know, cooks and butlers and servants. They would have been cutting firewood. You would have seen them on the square getting water, running errands. So slavery was very much a fabric of life, whether you're out in the countryside or in the city. 
But what happens, like John C. Spence tells us, is that when you have African Americans coming to town by the wagon load and taking up uh, housing wherever they can find it, um, the statistics tell us that by 1870, um, the census tells us that 52% of the population is African American all of a sudden in town, where before it may have been, you know, 25%. After Reconstruction, laws began to pass in southern states that further limited the rights of black men and women. With a war-torn economy and many states deep in debt, these new city dwellers found little or no work and even less acceptance. Reconstruction failed to deliver on its promises, and after 1870, states began working to restore the antebellum status quo. Laws were passed regulating the homes, jobs, and rights of African Americans. Apprenticeships were a part of these efforts to place freed men and women and their children in the yoke of servitude once more, paid low wages, and made slaves in all but name. Some schools for black students opened in the latter half of the 19th century, like Fisk School in Nashville, still open today as a university. But those students were limited by funding in the number of students they could enroll. And to a child in an apprenticeship in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, such a place would have seemed a distant dream. It is possible that Anna Butler learned how to read, as literacy was an important tenet of the Freedmen's Bureau. But her literacy would not overrule her race and her search for opportunities. Also, domestic service work that was primarily relegated to African-American women. It was often the only kind of paid employment those women had available to them. But um, other kinds of income earning would have been done through traditional female productive work. So again, uh, the products of your garden, of your chicken flock, uh, those would have been your ways to earn money as a rural woman or as a, even as a small town woman. The end of the Civil War marked the beginning of a more discreet form of discrimination that would haunt the South for a century, and whose effects can still be keenly felt in the United States today. The story of Anna Butler and those like her is a testament to that inequality. The lack of records shows a lack of concern for the African American experience, and while Anna Butler had a voice and opinion, a personality and will, its evidence has been lost, along with countless others. It is easy to group women of postbellum Tennessee under a tidy column of oppression. However, if anything can be seen in the stories of these three women, it is that no person can be so simply categorized. They dealt with assumptions based on their sex and race every day, and while at times they challenged it, at other times it was easier or safer to go along with such prejudices. They were all the products of their times, and progress has a slow march. Still, every person's story is worth sharing, and for a very long time many stories were tossed aside as unimportant, uninteresting. It is now in the hands of historians to repair this injustice.